Hello, I'm Dr. Paul Jeffords, an orthopedic spine surgeon and co-medical director of Resurgeon Spine Center in Atlanta, Georgia. If you are someone who is suffering from neck pain and radiating arm pain, numbness, or weakness, you may be one of the thousands of people each year who suffer from cervical radiculopathy, a condition that can result from stenosis or a herniated disc of the cervical spine. What I would like to do in this video is to explain what cervical radiculopathy is, explain the treatment options for cervical radiculopathy, and answer many of the commonly asked questions about herniated discs and cervical radiculopathy. In order to understand what a herniated disc is, it helps to begin with an understanding of the anatomy of your neck. The spinal column consists of 33 bones called vertebra that are stacked one on top of the other like building blocks. In the cervical spine, there are seven of these vertebra, labeled C1 through C7. The C7 is at the bottom and sits above the first thoracic vertebra, which is labeled as T1. In between each of the vertebra, there are spinal discs, which serve as cushions or shock absorbers for the spine. The disc between C4 and C5 is called the C45 disc. The bottom disc is called the C7-T1 disc. Behind the column of bone and disc is the spinal canal, which is a tunnel that is formed by a series of bony arches called lamina. Each block of bone has its own arch, which sequentially hooks onto the one below on either side of the spinal canal. Where they hook together, they form a pair of joints called facet joints. Running through the spinal canal is the spinal cord. At each disc level, a pair of nerves exits from the spinal canal, one on each side, and they branch off the spinal cord and exit from the spinal canal and radiate down the arms to supply the muscles, joints, and skin throughout the arms and hands. Sometimes these spinal nerves are called nerve roots because they look like roots branching off of a tree trunk. The spinal nerves exit from the spinal canal through tunnels that are called foramen that are bordered by the disc in front and the facet joints in the back. Because these nerves radiate all the way down to the hands, irritation or pinching of these spinal nerves within the spinal canal or within the foramen can result in pain or numbness that radiates down into the arms and hands. These arm symptoms are technically known as radiculopathy. The spinal nerve pinching that causes cervical radiculopathy in most cases can be caused by one of two conditions. The first is disc herniation or disc rupture, and the second is foraminal stenosis, which is the gradual narrowing of the foramen caused by disc bulging and bone spurs that result from disc degeneration and spinal arthritis. To understand disc herniations, we need to take a closer look at the structure of the disc. Each spinal disc consists of two parts, an outer wall called the annulus, which is like a tough ligament made of fibers that are woven together, and an inner nucleus, which is like a firm gel. Most disc herniations are not caused by a sudden injury, but caused by gradual disc degeneration due to the normal aging process. This process happens in all of us, but in some people it may progress at a faster rate or start at an earlier age. This is mostly determined by genetics. With normal aging and disc degeneration, small tears in the disc's outer annulus develop and slowly enlarge over time. The annulus becomes weaker, and pressure from the inner nucleus may cause the annulus to start to bulge. Eventually, the tears in the annulus may become large enough so that a portion of the inner jelly-like nucleus can push completely through the tear backwards into the spinal canal or into the foramen. When this happens, it is called a ruptured or herniated disc. Occasionally, trauma or an episode of heavy lifting causes sudden rupture of the disc, resulting in a more rapid onset of symptoms. A herniated disc can cause arm pain in two ways. First, the material from the nucleus that has ruptured into the spinal canal or foramen can cause mechanical pressure on the spinal nerves. Secondly, the material from the nucleus has chemicals in it that can cause the nerve roots to become very irritated. Both the pressure on the nerve root and the chemical irritation can lead to nerve inflammation and problems with how the nerve root functions. The combination of the two can cause pain, weakness, and numbness in the area of the body to which the nerve supplies sensation. Some of the treatments for disc herniation only affect the chemical irritation, while other treatments can affect both. Before going into the treatment options for cervical disc herniation and radiculopathy, it is important to understand what happens if you do nothing. Physicians call what happens when you do nothing the natural history. 
It is important to realize that a lot of people without neck or arm pain are walking around with herniated discs or foraminal stenosis, and that not all disc herniations or stenosis cause symptoms. When you do experience arm pain from a herniated disc, in many cases, it is just a temporary flare-up, and the symptoms can resolve on their own without specific treatment. Also, when you have a herniated disc, the nuclear material that has protruded out through the annulus into the spinal canal may slowly dissolve over time, relieving the nerve compression without the need for surgery. Foraminal stenosis caused by disc bulging and bone spurs, however, will usually not resolve on its own. But despite the fact that the foramen remains narrowed, the arm pain and numbness can resolve, in some cases, with minimal treatment. Despite the fact that many disc herniations do not need treatment, there are instances when disc herniations can cause significant neurologic dysfunction. Generally, the larger the herniation, the more severe the symptoms. In some cases, a large herniation can cause such severe nerve compression that it can cause significant muscle weakness in the arm and hand. The longer this muscle weakness remains present, the higher the chances that the weakness could become permanent. Fortunately, this is rare. Treatment for cervical radiculopathy can generally be broken into three separate phases of treatment. Phase one includes non-invasive treatments, phase two includes spinal injections, and phase three is surgery, which is rarely needed. The goals of treatment for each phase should be to relieve pain and improve function. Phase one of treatment consists of non-invasive options, including oral medications, physical therapy and home exercises, and cervical traction. In most cases, these treatments are prescribed based on your symptoms and physical examination alone, before confirming the actual presence of a herniated disc with an MRI scan. The medications may include steroids, which are powerful anti-inflammatories, non-steroid anti-inflammatories such as ibuprofen, and pain relievers such as Tylenol. Occasionally, stronger medications such as muscle relaxants and narcotic painkillers are prescribed for short-term flare-ups of severe pain. The medications do not shrink the disc herniation, but instead reduce the chemical irritation of the nerve by blocking inflammation. Physical therapy involves specific neck exercises that can temporarily slightly pull the disc away from the nerve, reducing the nerve irritation, allowing the nerve more opportunity to recover. This is also the theory behind cervical traction, which places a stretch on the neck, slightly opening the foramen to temporarily give the nerves more breathing room. If your radiating arm pain fails to improve after four weeks of physical therapy and medications, an MRI scan is required to confirm the presence of a disc herniation before proceeding to phase two. Phase two of treatment for cervical radiculopathy involves spinal injections called cervical epidural steroid injections. These are outpatient procedures where steroid medicine is injected into the spinal canal using x-ray guidance. The steroid medicine is injected over the pinched nerve and blocks the inflammation of the nerve, hopefully allowing the symptoms to resolve and eliminating the need for surgery. Sometimes more than one injection is needed, and a series of two or three injections given over a six to 12 week period may be required. The injections may be performed by a spine surgeon, but are more commonly performed by non-surgical spine specialists called physiatrists or by anesthesia pain specialists. Phase three of treatment for cervical radiculopathy is surgery. If epidural steroid injections have failed to provide significant relief of your arm pain, surgical removal of the disc herniation or bulging disc and bone spurs may be required. In some cases, patients have such severe arm pain or weakness that injections are bypassed and surgery is offered. There are three surgical options for treating cervical radiculopathy. The most commonly performed surgery is called an anterior cervical discectomy and fusion also called an ACDF. This surgery involves making a small incision in the front of the neck, removing the damaged disc and bone spurs that are pressing on the nerve, and fusing the bones above and below the disc together. An alternative surgery called artificial disc replacement is done by replacing the removed disc with a mobile implant that allows for continued motion of the disc segment. Lastly, a procedure called posterior cervical foramenotomy can be done for certain types of disc herniations and involves making a small incision in the back of the neck to remove the disc herniation. In summary, cervical radiculopathy and disc herniations are common, in many cases cause minimal or temporary symptoms, and oftentimes do not need specific treatment. In cases where disc herniations cause significant arm pain, medications and therapy are usually effective. Epidural steroid injections are sometimes needed, 
and in a small percentage of patients, surgery is required. Thank you for taking the time to watch this video. You may have additional questions, and if so, you may want to consult with your spine surgeon.